Well, listen, this morning we want to continue in our series on the presence, the empowering presence of God, the empowering presence of God, the empowering presence of God. So if you have your Bible this morning or uh, your phone or some kind of way to get to Scripture, turn to Psalm 16, our base Scripture for this series, and... um, Just to know that we're on a a journey here together in this series about presence, to find this place of God uh, and this empowering presence. And for each one of us personally uh, and for our church corporately, that means that we have to press in to find that place of his presence. And I, you know, the Lord put this on my heart because... I believe it's very important uh, for us. You know, we live our life and we, uh, we try to attain things in life and uh, get over <clears throat> issues in life and all of that. And, you know, God is saying, listen, just come to me. I have all the answers, right? We know those things. But I think we need to get a better revelation of just what his presence is and what it means for us. I was reading this past week. An American author and a priest uh, once said this. He said, you know, we Western people, we're goal-oriented consumers. And we can't imagine doing anything that won't get us something. But with full deliberation, we need to understand our exploration is not an effort to get anywhere. My starting point is that we're already there. We cannot attain the presence of God because we're already totally in the presence of God. What is absent is awareness. Little do we realize that God is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means that God is choosing us now and now and now and now. We have nothing to attain or even to learn. We do, however, have some things to unlearn. And I think that that's true for many of us. You know, we've, we've been around, some of us, we've been around so long, we've had so many experiences that things become, you know, second nature. And second nature is good, but sometimes when, it, when we deal with God, second nature is absolutely not good <laughs> because God is always doing something new, new to us, not new to him. You know, there's always something new. There's always a new word. There's always another place that he's taking us. That's the exciting thing about living this life. And so it's, it's about awareness. We, we just don't have the awareness that God's presence is everywhere. We say it, that God is omnipresent. We know that. But then if we really know that, how do we fall short sometimes? I can't, I mean, for all of us, I'm not, hey, listen, I'm not, I'm not wagging a finger. I'm talking about all of us. And maybe it's, it's a lack of true revelation and awareness that his presence is here. And making a place for God's presence means living in communion with God and a continual awareness, a continual reminder that we're in his presence. Psalm 16, our base scripture for this series, Psalm 16, verses 7 through 11, really just verse 11, uh, says, You will show me the path of life. Your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand, there are what? Pleasures evermore. And again, I love the God's Word translation of this verse 11. You make the path of life known to me, complete That word complete, complete joy is in your presence. Pleasures are by your side forevermore. You know, there are some people that understood the significance of God's presence, of God's presence. You know, there's, again, there's so many things that we want to attain. There's so many things that we want to accomplish. We want to be moral and ethical people. We want to, some of us have families and and climb the corporate ladder. Nothing wrong with that. And uh, have a great 401k and and be significant and leave a legacy. And there's all of these things that we want to do. And I think that Moses was a man who, when he first encountered God, he was just trying to live a quiet life on the backside of the desert, if you know the story. But he encountered the presence of God, and it changed his life. It changed his mind. It changed his spirit. It changed his perspective. 
Because we can see later on, Exodus 33, 1, watch this. Then the Lord said to Moses, this is years later after he had first encountered God's presence in the burning bush. The Lord said to Moses, depart and go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought, uh, whom I have brought, you have brought out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to you, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, to your descendants, I will give it. That is a promise. It's a promise. Now down in verse 14, watch this. And he said, this is Moses speaking now. He, he said, well, God said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses, talking back to God after he said that, he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us from here. Moses understood something. Moses, and he just didn't have a, a mental assent about something. He had a revelation in his spirit about God's presence. God, I understand that you told us to go to a place that you promised us. But if your presence doesn't go, well, I, I want you to go over there. Well, hang on a second. You going? I mean, because are you going? God just want to check and make sure. Well, I told you to go. I know what you said, but I'm just, are you going? <laughs> I just want to make sure you're going with us. Why would Moses make a statement like that about God's presence? Even though God gave him a command. We know how important a command of God is. Even though God gave him a command about a promise that he had made, and we know how sure God's promises are. Why would Moses make a statement like this? He, he said, I will give you the land that I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's because, it's because Moses had this revelation. He understood something that we think we understand, but we need a deeper revelation, a better revelation. And that is that in his presence, his presence changes impossibilities to possibilities. His presence changes Everything, everything that we thought we knew, his presence changes it all. His presence changes it. And, and if you don't understand that, I know the disciples didn't understand it. Even when, when Jesus said, listen, it, it's harder for a, a rich man to get into heaven than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And they were all amazed at this and said, well, how, you know, how, how can anyone be saved? And what did Jesus say? He said, uh, well, with men, it is impossible. But with God, come on. All things are possible. All things are possible. Now, in that, in that verse in Matthew, with God, uh, all things are possible. With men, it is impossible. With God, all things are possible. There's a key word in just that one little verse that really stood out to me. We look at that verse, and I, if you're like me, really, when you first read it, the word that stands out to you or words are impossible, impossible. Those are big words. Impossible. Impossible. But you want to know what the key word that whole verse hinges on? Is a little four letter word. Yeah, it's a four letter word. That's true. It's the word W I T H. With. With. With man, it is impossible. With God. With God. With God, being with God. And when you, when you hear that and when you get a revelation of it, it's just not God can do it. It's with God. I am with you. Your presence is with me. With God, all things are possible. In the presence of God, all things are possible. He says, I, I, I want them to be one with you. And as I want them to be one with each other as you and I are one, Jesus said to the Father. In fact, turn over to John. I don't want to just reference that. If you have your Bible, we don't have this up there. Turn over to John. If you have your phone or whatever, you can get there quickly. John chapter 17, the Gospel of John. I know we got first, second, third John. Turn over to the Gospel of John chapter 17. And uh, it, interesting things here that, that, that Jesus says. Because what we're going to talk about just for the next few moments is being in the presence of God, living in the presence of God, and really uh, one aspect of that, how it should bring us to a place of unity. 
Okay, and I'm going to remind you of that. Last year we did a series on presence and we talked about unity. But in 2 Peter, uh, Peter told the saints, he said, let me remind you of these things. All right. And so if Peter can remind the saints of these things, I would think Michael could also remind you of these things because God reminds me all the time of things that I think I already know. All right. So I want to remind you of some things. We're going to talk about how his presence ought to bring us unity. All right. Look in John 17, verse 20. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's talking about his disciples. That they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe you sent me. And the glory, verse 22, which you gave me, I have given them that I may that they may be one just as we are one. Now, go back up a little bit there in your Bible to verse 9 because something stood out to me. Something really stood out to me about this whole prayer, this whole chapter uh, of chapter 17. He, he, Jesus said this earlier in his prayer. He said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. Do you get the impact of what he said there before all of this? He said, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Not in this instance. I do not pray for the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, God, do you not care about the world? Well, of course we know that God does because Back in chapter 3, you may not have ever heard this verse before, but for God so loved the world. I know you might not have heard that, but it's in there that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We know that one, right? Even those at the football game and basketball game know that. They hold up the sign. So we, we know that one. So yeah, of course, God obviously cares about the world, but Jesus in this instance, when he goes on to talk about unity, he didn't say, I'm praying that the world will be unified. He said, I don't pray for the world. I'm praying for my disciples. I'm praying for those who are seeking me. Because the only way the world is going to be unified is if my church is unified. The only way that your world is going to live in unity is if my disciples live in unity. And the only way my disciples are going to live in unity is if they press in to my presence. They press into my presence. And I think one of the hindrances for us living in unity is not just the revelation about God's presence, but one of the hindrances, we really, some of us don't understand truly what unity is. I mean, unity, unity is not everyone looking the same, not even everyone thinking the same. Unity is simply this. It's multiple distinctive parts with a oneness of purpose. All of us, different backgrounds, different colors, different amounts of hair, different heights, whatever it might be, different clothes, different whatever, but we all have the same purpose. We're all going toward the same purpose. That's unity. And that's where we have to get to, church. And only in, in, in pressing into his presence will we get there. Only in pressing into his presence will we get there. You see, unity is not sameness, it's distinctiveness going in the same direction in order to achieve a common purpose. Why? Because unity is purpose-driven, not persons-driven. See, unity is presence-revealed, not people-defined. Unity starts with God, not with us. We can't get together and say what unity is going to be. We have to get, have it revealed to us. Jesus prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. Do you know how to do that without God? I don't. I don't understand how, how I don't understand the Trinity. You might say, well, you're supposed to be a pastor. Well, I, if you do, I, I don't know. <laughs> you may understand it a little more than I do. I know that there is one. I know that there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and he's the same because the Bible says the Lord thy God is one God. Yet Jesus was on earth praying to the Father and he sent the Holy Spirit. I do know that, but I know that the Lord thy God is one God. So you explain it to me. 
For now we see through a glass darkly, but we argue over stuff like that. This is what keeps us from being unified. We argue over things we don't understand without revelation. We, we can't really fully understand it until God reveal it to us. And maybe not until we're in his presence. And then he says, this is how that works. And we go, oh, I would have never thought of that. And he's like, yeah, so why you spend so many years arguing about it and making denominations over it? Don't let me get into that. Come on. And apart from sin, differences are absolutely critical, unquestionably essential, and eternally determined. God made us different. So we can't shun differences. He made us different. So when you try to change people apart from sin, you're trying to be God in their life. But what we need to do is pray, God, show me the purpose that we can, we can have the same purpose. Because God will do the rest of it. God will change hearts. God will line us up. God will do that. If our heart truly is for him, what do I always say? What does God want from us? He wants our heart. If he has our heart, he'll have our obedience. Do you obey somebody when, when you catch the vision? When, 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 when they have your heart, obedience is not a problem. You know, there are people that will obey somebody or stick with somebody to the very end. And it's not even because what they're saying is right. But it's because they're connected. It's because they, they have their heart. How much more, God, if we have his heart and he has our heart? You know, when you, when you see an orchestra before they perform, and I have uh, many times, it's a mess. It's a mess. And I'm not just talking about middle school orchestra. I'm talking about when you go to the symphony orchestra. If you get there early enough and they're tuning up and they're, you know, each one has their own, you know, uh, one's tuning to this middle C and one's, you know, a B. And it's, it sounds like a mess. And all this. You say, what in the world is going on here? What kind of a concert am I coming to? <laughs> they're in discord. But when the conductor comes out. I can't sing, so I don't know. But anyway, you know what it sounds like. You guys know what I mean. And it just sounds so beautiful. And everybody, and no, and they're not playing the same notes. Some of the lead violins are, but then you've got second and third violins. You've got, you know, whatever you have. I mean, you have all of the, the, the different instruments, and they're playing different notes, different strings. But it sounds beautiful because they have the same purpose, the same purpose. And that purpose changes you. Our problem with understanding unity is that we've allowed the world and the enemy to define it for us. The problem is that our individual worldviews come from our flesh instead of from our father sometimes. Sometimes we're, we, we need to just go into our closet and forget everything we knew, know and say, God, God, let me just take all of this out and allow you to pour in. And tell me what's right. You show me, God. You show me. The only way we're going to get that is to be in his presence. This is the importance of God's presence. I mean, healing, deliverance, all of prosperity, uh, revelation knowledge, peace, overcoming obstacles, being a conqueror. All of those things are in his presence. And it takes faith to be in the presence of God. Because the Bible says in Hebrews that those who come to God must believe that he what? Is. That he is. That he is God. That takes faith. And that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. So it takes faith to be in his presence. Presence is a word that speaks to demeanor and countenance. Uh, the air of a person who is present or, or visible or in a concrete nature to be there, to be, we know what that means. You know what it means when you're talking to someone. You can be standing there talking to someone and they could be daydreaming or thinking of someone else and you can tell, you can tell. And what would you say? You would say you're not present. Your body is here physically, but you're not present with me. See, that's, that's the revelation we have. We know God is omnipresent. I know he's around. I know he's around. God's around. Where is he? Oh, he's, he's around. 
But we want that manifestation, that felt, realized presence that he is here and he is listening and he is speaking. And in his presence, there is the fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures evermore. Why? Why is his presence so important? We, we, we seek so many things and we put so many things above the presence of God, not realizing that if we would make his presence first, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all, there's the word, all these things shall be added unto you. You want to know what my problem has always been? I have sought after all of these things, looking for the kingdom of God. And he said, just come to my presence, just come to my kingdom. And then all these things will be added unto you. God's presence demonstrates his desire to be with us. He, he, he draws us near to him. He, he's, he's not just here, he's everywhere. See, scripture begins and ends with the presence of God. In the beginning, God. God, and it ends with his presence. God's presence reveals who he is. See, he said in Exodus 29, I will dwell among the people of Israel and be their God, and they shall know, we have to know, come on, they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I may, here's the purpose, that I may dwell among them. He dwells both with you and in you. That's the presence of God and the importance of his presence. To know his presence is to know joy. So how does his presence bring us unity? How does God's presence bring us unity? Well, first of all, his presence gives us a singular focus. Because I, I don't, it, it doesn't matter, you know, when you come into the presence of God, what your opinion was, or even, uh, and I don't want to say that it doesn't matter, that, that's probably the wrong way to express it, but it's not as important what your experiences were, your environment was, how you grew up, your ethnicity, your gender, all of those things. When you come into the presence of God now, he gives you a singular focus, Okay, he has a purpose and he helps us to focus. That, that's what we're focusing on. It doesn't matter about us. What matters is that, what he's having us focus on. He gives us a singular focus. Now we can be together. His presence gives us a singular vision. How many know, that's why you have to be careful sometimes when you, when you have a question about what we should do and you put it out there to everybody. I mean, how many different opinions are you going to get? And now you're more confused than you, you had three ways you were going to do it. And now when you put it out to everybody, you confuse because there's 27 different ways that you could do it. And so, but, but when we come in, uh, whatever our visions are, when we come into the presence of God, he gives us a singular vision. And God has a unique way of lining up each of our, per, our significant purposes, bringing them together, meshing them, to accomplish his singular vision. God can do that. Well, that seems impossible. How can you do that with all these people? Hey, with man it is impossible. But with, with, W-I-T-H, with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. And he gives us a singular purpose. Jesus stood on the mount before he ascended into heaven and he said, go. Go. I'm, I'm going to give you a purpose. All of the purposes that you have are going to submit to this one purpose. Go, go into all the world, teaching them, making disciples, teaching them and baptizing them in the name, in the name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go, make disciples. All that we do comes under that singular purpose purpose. This is how he brings us into unity. But when we feel like our purpose, our focus, our vision is more important than others, I'm right and you're wrong, then that's how we get off track. But God said, hold on, hold on a second. You know, I'm reading through the book of Job right now. Again, 
And uh, it, it, it strikes me the same way every time once I get to about chapter 38, 39, and 40. Because all these other chapters, Job is going, you know what happened at the beginning. Job lost everything and, you know, the enemy and all of those type of things. And, and then you go through all of that middle part where he's going back and forth with his friends. You know, and, and who do you think you are? Well, who do you think you are? And why do you keep saying you're right? And they're, they're just going back and forth. And then finally God steps and finally God steps into the scene. Hold on a second. Where were you when I created the world? You guys are arguing back and forth. Some of you have good points, but you know nothing. You know nothing. There's your side. There's your side. And then there is the Almighty, <laughs> okay? There's what's right. There's that one who's been here before time was created and who will be here after time is gone, all right? I am here now, God is saying. Come seek me. And it just, every time I read that, it's like, whoa. <laughs> and I know it's coming. It's kind of like a movie that you've seen before and you know that part is coming, but you jump anyway. That's how it is when I read through Job and I get to that chapter 38, 39, 40. And he just breaks Job down and he says, you know what? And it's the greatest thing that anyone could ever say, I, I know nothing. Amen. All of this stuff I thought I knew, all this arguing I did with my friends, all of this listening I did, I, I know nothing. I know nothing. I've heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. This is the revelation we need to get. Saints, church people, Christians, disciples, this is the revelation we need to get, the revelation that Job got. I have heard of you with the hearing of the ear, but now I see you. I see you. I see you, Lord. I see you. I see you in everything. I see you in the struggle. I see you in the overcoming. I see you in the sickness. I see you in the healing. I see you in it all. I see you. This is the revelation we need to get. This is how God brings us to unity. And finally, he gives us a singular source. How many know that's so important? That's so important. I can't get a focus, a vision, and a purpose from a bunch of different sources. God gives us one source, one source. You know, I, I, I was talking about the symphony orchestra. One of the things that I've noticed in music is if you, you people tune a, a, a piano to a tuning fork, or used to anyway. I don't know how they're tuned now, but they used to be tuned to a tuning fork. And if this piano here is tuned to a tuning fork, then that piano would be tuned perfectly to this tuning fork. And if someone else had a piano over here, and they tuned that piano to this tuning fork, it would be perfectly tuned to this fork. And a piano over there, and a piano over there, and a piano over there. And if 10 pianos were all tuned to this tuning fork, they would be tuned each individually to this tuning fork. But you know what? You could take and set the tuning fork down, and all of those pianos would be tuned perfectly to each other. Why? Because they have one source. They're all tuned to the same source, the same tuning fork perfectly. And so that's how we get in sync. It's not just having meetings. Well, what do you think, Brother Jim? What do you think, Dietra? What do you think, Brother James? All right, well, let me tell you what I think. I think we need to pray. What do you think, God? What do you think, Lord? That's what we need to do. Vesta Kelly once said that snowflakes are one of nature's most fragile things. But just look at what they can do when they stick together. If you've ever hit, been hit with a snowball, you know what I'm talking about. Come on. Exodus 33, 13 and 14. Now, therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way. This is our prayer. That I may know you and that I might find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you. You know, you want to know one of the things that I realized about life. I'll end with this is that life isn't about making money or saving for retirement or having a fulfilling career or raising a family or leaving a legacy. Life isn't about accomplishing great things. It isn't about overcoming insurmountable obstacles. Life isn't about living, loving, and laughing or eating, praying, and loving. 
It isn't about reading books or having a great education. What I realize is that our primary reason for existence is relationship. Amen. Our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. And if we realize that, all of these other things fall into play. All of the other things fall into play. This is one of the reasons why we're starting small groups is because of relationship. Many Christians feel like Sunday morning, especially pastors, I can say it, feel like Sunday morning is the big thing, man. That's, that's what we're doing. We get together for Sunday morning service because I've seen people I haven't seen. And, you know, hopefully we're going to sing some good songs. And hopefully that guy says a couple things that I don't fall asleep on. And, you know, we can have a good time in church. And that's really where things are going to happen. And, you know, people are going to get healed. And deliverance is going to happen. And all of these things, heaven's going to come to earth because of Sunday morning service. And I'm here to tell you, Sunday morning service is a small part of our Christian life. You know, and I'll say this, as much as it pains me to say it, you know, because it's, it's, it's kind of, when I first started pastoring, it's kind of my thought as to why I was even here, was everything was going towards Sunday morning. But it's one part of our Christian service. It's one part of our Christian life. That's why one of the reasons that we're, we're going to do small groups is because of relationship relationship with each other. Yes, we need preaching. Yes, we need teaching. We need Bible study. Yes, we absolutely need all of those things. But can I tell you something? As much as we need those things, you also need to be reading your Bible on your own. You also need to be checking the scripture on your own to see if what that ballhead guy said is really true. Okay? And it's not just to prove me wrong, but it's to so that you will know for yourself. You know, that's why we're here. It's not to come see me or to see Pastor Dietra or whoever, Sister Jody or whoever teaching or uh, singing or whatever it is. We're, this is us together. This is us together pressing in to see what God would say to us, what he would say to us. Amen. And so it's about his presence.